Ephesians chapter 3, if you would. Now, don't start crying just because I'm preaching, all right? Wait till after I'm done preaching and then cry because you didn't like it. Um, Ephesians chapter 3. The theme for chapter 1 was God's plan, God's will being done. The theme for chapter 2 was old life and new life. Okay, now there's a theme for chapter 3. And uh, in the course of this, I'm going to teach you um, a... It's a school of thought in theology called, you, you may have heard me talk about it, but I'm going to explain it during this because it's mentioned in chapter 3. And, um, uh, but it's the, it's the school of thought called dispensationalism. And if you go to uh, like an independent Baptist church, uh, independent Baptists are the denomination that claim they're not a denomination. Okay? But they're all alike, or most of them. And they all pretty much believe the same thing. And if you don't believe what another independent Baptist church believes, they don't let you be in their group. I mean, they're pretty exclusive. Um, and now, most independent Baptist churches are King James. And I like that. However, um, I, I will, I'll wait to say what I'm going to say when we get to that, which probably won't be today. Uh, but because of dispensationalism, and I'll, I will say this, I've said this before, there are two, uh, two paths of dispensationalism. One of them, in my opinion, is just outright heresy. It is. Um, the, the more moderate form, I can, I can handle it. I don't agree with it. Um, but at least it leaves one gospel as being God's saving plan throughout all generations. And that's okay. Uh, but hyper dispensationalism is the one that has at least seven different gospels, all of them different and unique gospels uh, than the others. And it's funny because there's a verse in Revelation 14 where John sees an angel flying through heaven having the everlasting gospel. And dispensationalists or hyper-dispensationalists say that that is a different gospel than the one that you and I are under and that we're supposed to believe. And I look at that and I, and I because practically everything in hyper-dispensationalism has at least one or two verses that absolutely 100% contradict exactly what they said. So if I say that there is an angel who brings an everlasting gospel and that gospel is different than the one we believe, then I'll quote Galatians chapter 1. Though we or an angel from heaven bring you any other gospel, let him be accursed. So I'm going, if it is a gospel and the angel's bringing it, Paul said it's cursed. And I can't get around that. I can't say, well, he didn't mean that one. He said that's what he's told us to look for. Though we are an angel from heaven, bring you another gospel. So we'll, we'll get into that as we get into um, uh, what he, he actually says the word. Um, verse 2, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you word. So I'll just ask you very quickly tonight, what does it mean to dispense? Something? Huh? <laughs> That's a dispenser, right? 
the hand sanitizer or the hand cream or the hand soap, it dispenses the soap and we wash our hands. To dispense something is to give it out so it can be used, okay? But they make the word mean an era of time. And it doesn't mean that. But anyway, we'll get into that later. All right. Ephesians chapter 3. Oh, let's read. Um, we read down to verse um, 12. All right. I was looking for a period. Uh, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you. Word. See, he defines it there. A dispensation is given to me to you. Word. In other words, it's given to me so that I can put it into effect in your lives. How that by revelation, he, Christ, made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four in few words, whereby when you read, in other words, when you read the words of Paul, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So now twice he's mentioned that mystery. While in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. And so the word mystery in the Bible is only found in the New Testament. It's not found, and that's probably because mystery as a word is from a Greek word, musterion. So it's where we, Greek is where we actually get the word mystery. Um, they don't have the word musterion or musteria in Hebrew. But they did refer to the secret of God. Uh, but it was never revealed just in the Old Testament. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto... And I'm going to ask you to look at this verse and tell me what two groups the mystery is revealed to. This is important. Do what? Verse 5. Who is the mystery revealed to? The apostles and prophets. How? By the Spirit. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Is apostles singular or plural? So it's more than one apostle. I'm, I'm telling you this because believe it or not, Many dispensationalists believe that only Paul knew the mystery. Only Paul did. Peter didn't know it. James, John, Jude, Mark, Matthew, Luke. None of the other apostles knew it. Only Paul. But if you look at that verse... That verse contradicts that doctrine. It says the apostles knew it and the prophets knew it by the Spirit. Now, verse 6, that the Gentiles, here's one understanding or one aspect of the mystery, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. In other words, it's not just for Israel. It isn't. It's for the believing Israel and believing Gentiles. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So the gospel makes it possible for both the Jews and the Gentiles to be partakers of all of God's promises by Christ um, and makes us all part of the same body. 
Verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Paul's just simply saying here that when God gave him his ministry, it truly was a gift. Paul didn't earn it. He wasn't going to Damascus to encourage the saints, to, to encourage the Christians or to bolster them up. He was going to kill them. So, and, and I think Paul uh, really just lamented this all, the rest of his life. I think Paul just said, what was I? I came that close to having the saint's blood on my hands. Why God picked me, I have no idea. Because I was an enemy to Christ. And yet he chose me. And so Paul is all about, he says, I was made a minister. By the, according to the gift of grace, I didn't deserve it. Grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. God literally changed that man's mind instantly when he met him on the road to Damascus. Now verse 8, unto me who am less than least of all the saints. Here's Paul now telling it like he really believes it. Now we look at Paul and say... He was the number one Christian of all Christians. Paul, who gets to write uh, at least 13, if not 14, of the books of the New Testament, uh, more than any single person at any, in any other place in the Bible, nobody in the Old Testament wrote as many books, nobody in the New Testament wrote as many books, Paul is the preeminent saint of God. Why he never made Pope, I'll never know. I mean, you would think that of all the people that Christ would choose to be head of his church, that it would be Paul. But according to Catholics, it was Peter. But Paul says unto me, who, uh, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of, here he says again, the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. He's talking about the angelic realm, good and bad, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. And to me, I love this. God has revealed to us Something that he didn't even tell the angels. So the Psalms say, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. And yet it is God revealing to us the mystery and all the mysteries Things that he wouldn't even tell the angels. Especially, he didn't tell the devil. He didn't tell Satan. If Satan, we know this by way of scripture, if Satan would have known that by killing Jesus on the cross, that that would basically be um, it for him, that it would spell his doom, then obviously he would have never killed him. If the Philistines would have known that Samson would have called unto the Lord and got just a little bit of reserve strength in him, enough to bring those two pillars down that supported the whole building. If the Philistines would have known that ahead of time, do you think they would have ever let him stand by those two pillars? Not a chance. We're not going to put it. Don't put him there. Have you seen this guy and how he works? I know. I mean, I know he's weak now, but do you see his hair growing? Uh... I wouldn't put him there if I were you. That just don't look safe. Well, we're going to put him there anyway. Well, I'll see you guys next week then. 
uh, they would have never done it. And that's part of this here. So he tells us, the church, and if the devils and the angels want to find it out, they got to hear it from us. God's pretty cool. He takes the people who are lower than the angels and he gives them something that he won't even give the angels. So verse 11, um, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord, this was God's purpose. Even before the foundation of the world, God had all of this planned out. He knew how it was going to break down. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Now, what we're going to do uh, tonight and probably next Sunday night is we're going to find out by way of scripture what this mystery is all about. Um, Chris, you were a Roman Catholic. And Melissa, you were a Roman Catholic. So when you were in those church services, did you ever hear the priest mention the word mystery? The mystery of the Eucharist. The mystery of... Um, the, yeah, the, the mystery of the Mass. The mystery of uh, the extreme unction, which is the last rites. Uh, everything to them was a mystery. Uh, in the Catholic Church... You don't ever understand the mystery. They want it mysterious. And so the church itself tells you that it's a mystery, but it doesn't explain to you what that mystery is. It doesn't reveal to you that it is a mystery or that, that there is an explanation for it, and they don't give you the explanation. In that sense, then... They are what's referred as a mystery religion. Any religion that holds uh, secret meetings, that has secret doctrines. Uh, remember uh, what Satan came up with to Eve. He came up with a secret mystery doctrine. For God doth know that in the date you're of, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, the devil was putting that out there as a true doctrine, but it's one that God doesn't want you to know. So literally now, uh, and I'm, I'm putting together notes on the practice of yoga. And yoga basically has a spirit that is behind every aspect of it. And those who teach yoga and practice yoga don't have a problem telling you what spirit that is. It's the spirit of the serpent. The serpent is the spirit that guides the yogi into his connection or his yoking together with these gods of Hinduism. And... Uh, people say, well, I just do the exercises of it. Well, I just do this. We don't really get it. Listen, the exercises themselves are part of that process of connecting you to the gods. What did Paul say about bodily exercise? Profiteth little. But then he followed it up by saying, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And so you'll have yeah, churches having yoga classes. Pastors and pastors' wives going to yoga or teaching yoga. And it, but it's Christian yoga. We're here meditating on Christ and they make it sound good. But the truth of it is, it is a form of prayer to a false god. And God said, you can't do that. You, you're having other gods before me and I'm a jealous god and I'm not going to deal with it nicely. Um, but anyway, mystery... Mystery religions, mystery cults, uh, secret societies, they all have this mystery doctrine that nobody can know about, nobody can, uh, that its members can't discuss it, they can't talk about it, they can't reveal it to the world. It all has to be kept a secret. And that in itself is a, a mystery religion. But what does the Bible say? And I, and I realized years ago, 
that every time the word mystery was used in the scriptures, there is an explanation of what that mystery is. In other words, the Bible's revealing it as it mentions it to you. It doesn't say, this is a great mystery. And then leave it. Paul said, this is a great mystery. But I speak of Christ and the church. Now he just told you what the secret was, what the mystery was. He revealed it to you. So, Mark 13 is the first place we find the word mystery or mysteries. It comes in two forms in the Bible. Mystery or plural mysteries. And there, uh, there are several um, different aspects of the mystery. But they all basically are joined together and are part of the same. So in Matthew 13, Matthew 13 is a chapter that is loaded down with parables. And most of them are about seed. In Matthew 13, you have the parable of the seed and the sower. In Matthew 13, you have the parable of the wheat and the tares. In Matthew 13, you have uh, the parable of um, the mustard seed. You have, uh, what else you have here? Matthew 13, I think there's another one in here. There's the, there's the wheat and the tares. Um, here we have the treasure in the field. We have the pearl of great price. We have the fish in the sea. Um, what else? But anyway, you have all of these um, mysteries revealed. And in, and in verse 11, the, uh, the disciples have come to him. He taught them about the... the the, um, the sower who sowed seed. And um, he says, some fell among, by the wayside, some fell among thorns, some fell upon stony ground, and then some fell on good ground, and they brought forth a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirty. And he says, he who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So verse 10, the disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? In other words, why don't you just, why don't you speak plainly? Well, there's a, a, a reason here. And he says in verse 11, he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you, my disciples, the saints, the people who believe the Bible and believe Jesus. Unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But unto them, the unbelievers... It's not given. And he said, so I'm going to give a parable. And if you want to know what it means, then trust what I say. If you trust and believe in what I say, then you'll stick around long enough you'll, or you'll keep reading. And then you'll know what that parable means because I'm going to explain it to you. So he says, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So, number one, if you're writing this down, you should. If you're writing this down, the mystery itself is a general revelation to all of those who put their trust in Christ and who believe God's word. So, number one. The mysteries and the, and the revealing of the mysteries is a, a general revelation. What I mean by that is that we have everything that God has for this world from the beginning to the end. We have all the works of God pertaining to this world and this creation from the beginning to the end, um, we have all the doctrines, the manners, the customs, the things that God does, the character of God, the nature of God, the will of God. All of those are revealed all throughout 
all of the scriptures. Okay? So uh, we have, in that sense, we have a general revelation. Anybody who believes the Bible and is born again, the Holy Spirit, as you read the scriptures, will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit will show you what this means. He'll show you what that means. He'll open this up to you. He'll reveal that to you. So on and so on and so on. So what he's telling the disciples here is, number one, if you follow me, you believe what I said, you believe the Bible, you put your trust in Jesus, then you're going to know not just a mystery, but you're going to know all the mysteries. They're all going to be revealed to you. You just keep reading. And as you read the Bible, more and more things are revealed to you. So number one, it's a revealing or a general revelation of all things pertaining to God, Jesus Christ, this world, heaven and hell, and so on. So that if you want to know whether or not you personally are going to heaven, where's the best place to go? To the priest? To the preacher? Joe Biden? What's the best place to go? The Bible. The Bible is going to give you a general revelation that if you want to know where you're going to spend eternity, the Bible will tell you that. If you look at it and you find out you're going to hell and you don't believe it, then nothing's revealed to you. You'll still, you th then will go to some other source and say, am I going to heaven? Oh yeah, you're a good guy. Oh yeah, we like you. You're going to heaven for sure. So it's a general revelation. Now, in Mark 4, 11, same situation here. Um, he gives forth um, the seed and the sower, the parable of the seed and the sower. Um, in verse 9, he said unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him uh, with the twelve. In other words, we have the twelve apostles plus others who are part of this following of Christ. When he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery, singular, of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins be forgiven them. So let me ask you a question. Is there, is there a part of the Bible that we don't have yet, but we believe that God is going to send down a further revelation to mankind that we currently don't have? No. Mm -mm. Everything is in the Bible. So... Do we say to people who are not church members or we think that are not saved, listen, you probably shouldn't read the Bible because there are things in there that you're not supposed to know because you're not born again. Do we say that to people? What do we tell people about the Bible? Read it. Read all of it. Start in Genesis. Read all the way to the book of Revelation. You can start with Matthew and read to the book of Revelation. You can just read the book of Revelation. You can read any part you want. Read the Bible. And if they believe it, God then will start revealing things to them. And then at some point, they'll have revealed to them that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Savior of mankind, and that um, God... Uh, worked with Israel in the Old Testament, but now he's called the Gentiles uh, to be fellow partakers of the inheritance and so on. And they'll, they'll find out all of these mysteries eventually. But we can't keep people from reading the Bible in general. And so all of the mysteries that you and I have had revealed to us by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God, they're in the same Bible that a lost man would read, and yet he never figures it out. He doesn't believe it. Uh, I, 
mentioned this before, Alexander Scurby, who did, in my opinion, one of the best readings of the King James Bible. Uh, it's the most popular ever. Uh, he read, was hired to read and be recorded reading the whole Bible. He read the entire Bible. Didn't believe it. Died lost. Uh, there was a science fiction writer by the name of Isaac Asimov. He wrote um, the original story for um, 2001, A Space Odyssey. He wrote I, Robot. Uh, he wrote a ton of science fiction. He was a futurist. Um, and believe it or not, there is an, a book called Isaac Asimov's commentary of the Bible. He wrote a Bible commentary, Chris. And he basically went through, as an atheist, mind you, and it tried to explain away any miracles or any belief about Christ being the Son of God or Christ's resurrection from the dead. He had nothing but explanations of how it didn't happen that way. So he not only read the Bible, he studied the Bible, but he studied it with the context of, I don't believe in God, so therefore, anything that might be somewhat true in the Bible, I'm going to explain it in such a way as that it does away with any miracles, it does away with anybody coming back from the dead, it does away with anything about heaven or God or anything like that. So he studied the Bible, cover to cover, wrote a commentary on it, didn't believe a word of it, died lost. So did he have any mysteries revealed to him? Nope. And he read the same verses that you and I read. Same verses. Okay? So, huh? Yes, ma'am. Tell her to read the law and say, you know what, let me say this a different way. What you just said, let me say it a different way. Biden loves everybody. He's not going to let anybody go to jail. Yeah. He's not going to let anybody go to prison because he loves everybody. If people have to go to prison for committing crimes against the laws in the United States. If there's a God and he gave us laws to live by and people don't live by them, God has to punish those who don't live by his laws. To me, it's that simple. She says she prays to Mary. Well, I'm sure she does. And I'm sure that's where she got her... And she says she's going to heaven, but she's on the beach every day Drinking it up, partying, carrying on. So is that why you go down there? No. Oh, okay. No. Not me. Um, yeah, so unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That they'll see it, they'll read it in the Bible, but they won't they won't perceive it. They'll hear it, but they won't understand it. And because they won't understand it, they'll die in their sins. So again, a general revelation, but to those who don't believe it, it's the same Bible, the same verses, they just won't understand it. Okay? Uh, Luke 8, pretty much the same thing. Uh, they're asking him about the parable of the of the uh, good seed and the good ground and the the seed and the sower uh, verse 10 unto you it is given to know the mysteries plural of the kingdom of god but to others in parables that seeing they might see and hearing they might not understand and then he goes on to explain the parable the seed is this uh, the seed is the word of god now he's now any place that you read 
in the Bible where it mentions seed, you can think this is the word of God. So laws like you should not sow your, um, your field with diverse seeds. In other words, you can't take your radish seeds, Roy, and your tomato seeds and uh, your pumpkin seeds and your uh, bell pepper seeds and all that stuff. You can't take them, pour them into a bucket, mix them around, and then throw them out into your garden. Okay? Imagine if you did that and if everything came up, how in the world would you go pick it? Okay, it'd be a mess, wouldn't it? But now that we live in this age where seed is rewritten. And they come out with a corn seed that has mingled into it the traits of, let's say, a cucumber. And that's sown into a field. God's already prohibited that by the way he said it. You don't mingle the seeds together. You don't do it. You don't gender your cattle with a diverse kind. A diverse kind means any other kind of creature. So you don't mix human DNA into a milk cow to make the milk drinkable by those who are allergic to dairy milk. But that's exactly what they've done. They've mingled certain things out of the human genome into these dairy cattle so that those who are lactose intolerant or dairy milk intolerant can now drink the milk from these cows and it did not affect them in any way. And I'm like, that's crazy. But God's already said thousands of years ago, you can't do that. So he's got it covered. We understand now because this mystery is revealed to us that the same thing that people are doing with the Bible, they're now doing with DNA. They're mingling things into it that should never be there. Um, that I haven't, I haven't said this uh, publicly. Alicia shared it with me uh, the other day. Um, there's a reason why I believe God has us in Kenya. There are a lot of churches in Kenya. Unfortunately, most churches and, and a lot of pastors, um, they're very, they're ignorant of the word of God. And I say that not in a derogatory way. It's just that there's a lot of things in the Bible that they don't know. And one of the things that I emphasized this last trip there was you guys really need to start reading your Bible. Because there was a pastor out toward... Uh, um, Mombasa that over the years he has convinced several of his own church members that the only way they can purify themselves and rid themselves of this flesh is to fast literally until they die. So far, the police have uncovered over 200 bodies that have been buried out in the woods in shallow graves. These are all people that he convinced that the only way that they were ever going to make it to heaven was to starve themselves to death. Now, if those people, and the fault is twofold, the fault, number one, is on the false prophet who told them that they had to do that. 
The other fault is on the people who refused to read the word of God and find out this guy was lying to them. But 200 people now dead because of their willful ignorance of God's word. The mysteries were not revealed to them, even though they had a Bible and they could have read it. But somehow, some way, this guy talked to those people. And I'll just be honest with you. There are a lot of false prophets in Kenya. They love to get a large following, make promises to people about how God is going to heal them, about how God has used this man to raise people from the dead, about um, how uh, they're going to be all wealthy and everything. And, and you give these people all these promises that God's going to do, but they have to do exactly everything that this prophet tells them to do, which gives him then the opportunity to sleep with their women and their daughters. And he will. They will use that to take their money, to take their wives, and in some cases, molest their children. But he's the man of God. And we don't question the man of God. They're in bondage. And all they have to do is read the word of God to be made free. What makes people free? The truth. Okay. Uh, Romans 11. Turn there. Here's another revelation of the mystery. Uh, and it's giving us, you know, so the first, first three verses were declaring to us that there is, there is a general revelation of all things of God given to us by the scriptures to those who believe it. Now, this is another aspect of the overall mystery. This is one of the sub-mysteries. Uh, let's pick it up in... Oh, let's see here. Let me get to the verse here. Verse uh, 23. And they, meaning Israel, also, if they abide not still in unbelief. This is the story about the olive tree. And the natural branches were Israel. But the natural branches were cut off and taken away. And we, as wild olive branches, have been grafted in so that we partake of the DNA. We partake of the water and the nutrients given by the olive tree. And now it's given to us and we grow and we manifest the fruit of God, the fruits of the Spirit. And... God blesses that and we're all happy. And God says to us now, don't get all arrogant and proud over this because if God took off the natural branches because of unbelief, what do you think he would do to the wild branches grafted in if they didn't believe? Take them out. And so he says... In verse uh, 23, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. In fact, it's easier to graft in a natural branch than it is a wild branch. Verse 24, for if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? It just makes sense. It's a whole lot better to graft them in than it was to graft us in. But then he says, Now, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. What mystery? Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So now we have 
a part of God's plan. Part of God's plan is Israel, and I like to illustrate it like this. Here's the Old Testament, here's the New Testament. And Israel is blind on the New Testament side. They can't see the New Testament and they won't read it. It's a goyim to them. It's a goyim Gentile heresy and they won't believe it. So they're blinded in part. Not always. They can still read the Old Testament, but just reading the Old Testament won't cut it. They still don't know who Jesus is. None of the mysteries can be revealed to them. But when God is done saving the last Gentile. Oh, I'd like to find out who that is. I'd like to know who it is now so I could just hang around them and watch their life. And say, oh, one of these days, you're going to be the last one. And just watch them as God saves them. And when he saves the last Gentile, we're gone. We're going to be taken into heaven. Blindness in part is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles uh, come in or be come in. So in the last Gentile, when that fullness is ready, boom, what God's going to do is take us and then he's going to open up the eyes of Israel. The veil of Moses is going to be lifted and they're going to know who the Messiah is. It's going to be Jesus and they're going to know it. And they're going to believe it. And God's going to take his covenant and write it in their hearts. It's going to be a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, not like the old covenant. And they're going to be saved exactly the same way as you and I were saved. Exactly. It's by grace through faith. So that's part of the mystery. Okay? That don't count Israel out. God still has an awakening for them, but it won't come until our dominion is gone. Do you remember uh, the uh, blessing that um, Isaac gave to both Jacob and Esau? Remember, Jacob went in pretending to be Esau and he got away with it. So he got this blessing. Esau comes in once his firstborn son blessing, but he can't get it. He realizes it. So he says, don't you have a blessing left for me? And, he's, and he basically gives him the same thing. Same words he said to Jacob. But he said, but you can't have yours, I'm paraphrasing, until the dominion of your brother is taken away. Your brother now is in charge. He's, he's Lord over you. He's the firstborn son now. But when his dominion is taken away, then you can have your blessing. And that's Israel. When we're gone, they get their blessing. They get theirs. How did Elisha get his double portion? Elijah had to leave first. And God said... Now you can have the double portion. Okay? That's, and now you have the revelation of the mystery. And now you can go to the Old Testament and you can see it there. Let's do one more. Romans, since we're in Romans. Romans 16. Now to him... That is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Remember, the whole of the mystery is God's plan and God's will being revealed. It's a general revelation. The revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So, with the revelation of the mystery 
how is it going to be revealed to all nations? How is it going to be revealed? By the scriptures. So if anybody says, God revealed to me personally by myself a private revelation only I know this, and only I can reveal it to you. It's not in the Bible anywhere. No other preacher has ever had it revealed to them. And this is, I, I, I just laugh at some of these YouTube false prophets. They're talking about how God gave them uh, a miraculous vision in a dream about what was going to happen to America and how COVID was going to bring in the mark of the beast. It didn't happen, did it? There's nobody with the mark of the beast on them. Nobody that got a COVID vaccine got their DNA changed. Nobody got the mark of the beast, none of that happened. And yet there were people who were saying that God gave them a private revelation and they are going to reveal this great mystery to everybody and only they know it. You don't believe them. You don't believe a word they say. Because right here, all of the mysteries are revealed by the scriptures of the prophets. Okay? So if you want to know more, read more. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.